Well, happy Friday. Thanks for joining us. I'm Alex Bell, and this is To The Point, where we take the time to go in-depth into issues that are affecting the lives of Northern Californians. And if you've taken a DNA test to learn more about your ancestry, you might want to check your results again. A new update has changed some customers' results. Testing companies have been working to improve a deficiency that makes some people's results less accurate and less specific than others. For months now, Becca Habegger has been following two women's journeys of discovery as they have experienced this deficiency firsthand. What makes up someone's identity? I don't really know much about my life before I was adopted from an orphanage in Wuzhou, China. What makes you, you? All my life, a lot of people misidentify me as Filipino. Is it family? My answer has always been very complicated because my two moms are my real parents. It's just not even a question. Is it genetics? My mom is Vietnamese, 100%, and my dad is 100% Japanese, to our knowledge. So it should be somewhere roughly 50-50. Justine Bellari of Rockland and Catalina de la Pena, who lives in Sacramento when she's not attending college in New York, have each taken the 23andMe DNA test to learn more about their respective family's genetic history. I've been wanting to take one ever since I was little. Catalina took the test last year. Most people, they know their birth story. They know how they came to be. The one thing that I'll, I'll probably always think about for the rest of my life is my birth parents and where they are now or if they think about me ever. Adopted as a baby from China, she hoped the results would give her information about the biological family and past she's never known. I was just kind of expecting I was going to be Chinese. I probably thought maybe I'd have like, oh, 15% Korean. But what she learned. The results were so insane. I really wasn't expecting it at all. Rocked her sense of identity. It said I was 85% Vietnamese and then 15% different parts of like Chinese. I already felt like a fraud almost in my culture. I couldn't really connect to my Chinese heritage at all growing up, especially growing up in the Midwest. And it was very white. So I just didn't, I think, connect to my culture culture as much as I would have liked to. When I got the test results back, it felt like the death of my culture all over again. And I was like, oh my God, I, I don't even know anything about being Vietnamese. She documented her feelings for a college project she named the death of my Chinese self and rebirth. I think I'm still kind of trying to process what that means to me. We just took the test just for funsies. Justine took the 23andMe test two years ago. Her results also came with a surprise. She was 50% Vietnamese as expected, but only 41.5% Japanese. And then there was this 8% like Filipino. It was interesting because a lot of people, they ask if I'm Filipino. And I'm just like, oh no, like, no, I'm not. I'm half Vietnamese, half Japanese, but I guess I am. And now that Justine and her husband are expecting their first child, this family history is knowledge they can pass along to their daughter. I'm very proud to be Japanese and Vietnamese. Adding another um, country in there for me was exciting. Like, yeah, I'm Filipino too. <laughs> but these tests have limits. How specific and accurate your results are depends on where your ancestors are from. When you spit into a tube and send it to a testing company, your DNA is compared to a pool of people with known ancestry called a reference population. It's looking at who are you genetically similar to. Dr. Graham Coop is a human evolutionary geneticist and UC Davis professor. He says the specificity and accuracy of someone's results boils down to the testing company's reference population. If a particular area of the world, they don't have a lot of reference individuals from. You won't actually be able to tell whether someone's from that area of the world. Areas which are better covered in their databases, they'll have more granular information about ancestry. Knowing that different companies have different reference populations. It's so interesting to know that they can find all that out from spit. <laughs> we asked Justine and Catalina if they'd like to take an ancestry DNA test and compare it to their 23andMe results, like Justine's previously unknown Filipino ancestry. I would be interested to see if that does show up as well. Okay, so I'm going to spit into the tube. Then we packaged up their samples and sent them off for testing. Very, very interesting. The Ancestry DNA test results came back in less than a month. Huh, yeah. <laughs> for Catalina. 56% Vietnamese. Some significantly different numbers. I guess my first thought immediately is I'm less Vietnamese than I originally thought. Saying I'm like 85% Vietnamese to like saying I'm half Vietnamese, half Chinese is definitely 
a lot to process. Wow, okay. Justine's ancestry DNA test results included a total surprise. So the 23andMe said I was 50% Vietnamese. Ancestry says I'm 30% Vietnamese, which is very interesting. And it says I'm 44% Japanese, which kind of aligns with the 23andMe. 10% Filipino, so I am apparently Filipino. And then it says I am 13% um, Southern China. So I'm Japanese, Vietnamese, Chinese, Filipino. That's a lot of things I didn't know I was. The whole being Filipino was shocking when I found that out. Adding in Chinese, that's even more shocking. We reached out to both companies to ask about the differing results. These are estimates based on reference populations and those reference populations are typically different from one comp company to the next. Sam and Kona Esselman is a 23andMe product scientist. She says people with ancestry traceable to island nations like Japan and the Philippines tend to be easier to pinpoint. A population that's lived on an island for centuries or millennia is typically going to be a lot easier to identify as a distinct population just because of that geographic isolation than a population that, you know, maybe is in the middle of a continent and has had a lot of kind of migration going through it. Because of extensive migration, she said, China proved to be more of a challenge for 23andMe scientists. China, we knew that there was work to be done. So they drilled down into a recent study and just earlier this month rolled out an update with more specific genetic populations within China, an update that changed the original results for Catalina. The updated results from 23andMe are more similar to my original ancestry DNA results. Instead of 85% Vietnamese, as 23andMe originally reported, Catalina's results now show 63% Vietnamese and more than 20% from the southern Chinese province of Guangxi. Catalina let us share this with 23andMe's scientist. That's pretty cool to see that she has that really specific ancestry and Guangxi is actually closer to Vietnam and kind of historically might have a little bit more of that shared genetic ancestry with Vietnam. We took Ancona Esselman's answers back to Catalina. The update that they 23andMe have done is, is really great. It's really interesting how reference populations can really just affect your results. Which brings us back to the question of identity. It'd be great to get more accurate results on the first time, but I'm, I'm really grateful for that because it has helped me realize that identity is something that everyone you know struggles with and it's something that's very fluid and it can be always changing. A journey of discovery that goes beyond genetics. Justine is one of our colleagues here at ABC 10 and Catalina is our boss's daughter. We want to thank both of them for sharing their journeys and their discoveries with yes. us these past several months. Quite an intimate uh, journey that they shared with Absolutely. us so publicly, so thank you. Yeah, and Justine's getting ready to have her baby soon. She just went on maternity leave and we could not be more thrilled to have an ABC 10 baby. So super excited about that. But you did mention two companies. You mentioned 23andMe and then Ancestry DNA. We heard from 23andMe, but what about Ancestry DNA? What did they have to say about this? Yeah, so Ancestry DNA didn't provide someone to interview, but they did give us a statement in which they said, like 23andMe, they're constantly working to grow and diversify their reference population. And as they do, they're going to be able to, you know, reanalyze your genetic data in greater detail. So bottom line, if you have taken one of these tests in recent years, it's really worth revisiting your results online to see if they have updated. And the good news is you don't have to do anything. You don't have to retest. All you have to do is check those results because they are automatically updated. Yeah, just refresh your portal. That's all you got to do. And then last question here very quickly. Um, what about privacy? When we talk about DNA and genetics, D uh, privacy is always a question that's brought up. What about that? Yeah, privacy is so important when it comes to DNA testing. And of course, we don't have the time to dive into it deep here. But basically, what you need to know is each DNA testing company has its own privacy policy that guides how it protects your genetic data. It's really worth looking into each company's policy before you decide which one to go with or whether to test at all. And in fact, the National Library of Medicine has a great resource on what you need to know before making that decision. All right, Becca, thank you so much. Always good to see you on a Friday, too. I love that. Happy Friday. <laughs> all right, thanks, Becca. Thousands of farm workers and their supporters arrived at the state capitol this morning after a 24-day march from Delano. Now, the United Farm Workers are urging Governor Newsom to sign AB 2183, a bill that would allow farm workers to vote in union elections by mail or drop-in boxes. Assemblymember Mark Stone introduced the bill, and he says that it would allow for fairer elections. They typically vote on a grower site under the watchful eyes and influence of that grower or the labor contractor. So there's a real question of whether that vote is their own, absent coercion and absent pressure. 
The director of UC Berkeley Center for Law and Work says that farm workers are especially vulnerable to intimidation because many of them are undocumented. Farm workers also have different federal protections than other industries. Now, on the other hand, some agriculture associations against the bill are against the bill. Excuse me. The California Chamber of Commerce put AB 2183 on its job killers list. They say that the bill would leave employees vulnerable to coercion and manipulation by labor organizations. Governor Newsom is set to veto the bill. His office sent a statement saying that he is eager to sign legislation to expand worker rights. However, quote, we cannot support an untested mail-in election process that lacks critical provisions to protect the integrity of the election and is predicated on an assumption that government cannot effectively enforce laws. We'll be right back after this. Every Friday on To The Point, John Bartell is hitting the back roads. And tonight he heads to the California-Oregon border where three hydroelectric dams will be removed next year. Some of those dams are more than 100 years old and removing them will allow the Klamath River to flow freely and open up more than 300 miles of wild salmon and fish habitat. The Yurok tribe is one of the leading advocates for this project that's been in the works for more than a decade because the Klamath River has been an integral part of their culture for thousands of years. Before the dams were built, before the trees were logged and before the fish were blocked from going upstream, the Klamath River was a highway for the Redwood Canoes taking tribes from the Oregon border to the Northern California coast. We've taken these canoes places where they haven't seen canoes in like over a hundred years, so it's been pretty special. The Yurok were not the only Native American tribe to navigate the Klamath, but they were among the last. There's only about 11 of these in existence. So this is one of the rarest vessels in the world right here. Normally, Julian Markison wouldn't be taking a tourist like me for a ride in a Yurok canoe. The Othwayach, as they're called, is a sacred vessel. But last year, the tribe had a change of heart and started offering the public two-hour tours down the Klamath. You can't have people respect you if they don't know about you. The Yurok people were once great canoe builders. I mean, usually, this is just a mountain of chips. Well, that is right there. But if you ask around the reservation today, there's really only one man carrying on the tradition. I learned 14 years ago was the first canoe I built, and I've been around him ever since. David Severns was in his 50s when he first learned to build canoes. Today, he can count the number of experienced canoe builders on one hand. Our goal, our camp's goal, is to keep our kids out of trouble through culture. David uses a mix of modern and ancestral tools to teach canoe building, but the most important part of a redwood canoe cannot be found on the reservation. The tribe itself doesn't own big timber. That's been taken away by timber companies or lost through mismanagement of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The centuries-old redwood logs needed to build the Yurok canoes must be acquired from the government or private land. Either way, transporting those logs to Yurok country is very expensive. So the opportunity to continue doing this is coming solely from the tours taking them rides. I mean, it's, it's sad, but it's, it's, it's important for us. Old growth redwoods were once abundant along the Klamath, but as the Yurok were pushed off their land, sawmills and fish canneries took their place and took the resources that the river provided. These silver bark ones right here, they're the alder trees. As Julian paddles along the bank, he explains, the river is in a constant state of healing itself. When everything got cut down, they were the first ones to grow back. So they earned the name, the scab of the woods. Another wound that the alder trees are growing over is the damage from the Christmas flood of 1964. Flood waters continue spreading over southern Oregon and northern California with many areas isolated from land transportation. Considered to be one of the worst floods of its time, the waters wiped out roads, homes, and much of the industry in the area. Even the Yurok experienced major loss. All the canoes, uh, there's a couple dance sites and older buildings. 
Just a few months after the flood, a tsunami hit Crescent City, which is the largest city in the area. The massive wave slammed into downtown, devastating 29 city blocks. After that, you know, everyone just kind of cruised out of Klamath, and they actually gave the land back to the Yurok tribe. The land along the Klamath is healing, but the water is still sick. Dams, they're kind of the biggest culprit in making the river sick. Upstream, five hydroelectric dams slow the water in the Klamath. In years of drought, plumes of blue-green algae grow in the slow-moving water. Back in 2002, the algae caused a massive fish kill, suffocating tens of thousands of salmon. It seemed like the end of times, really. And that sparked a big movement that, you know, we have to do something now or else nothing's going to happen. For more than 20 years, the Yurok, other Native American tribes, and conservationists from all over the state fought to restore the water flows in the Kalamath. And thanks to those efforts, the complete removal of four out of five dams will begin in 2024. And so 300 plus miles of habitat are going to be brought back to balance and restored to its natural habitat. The Klamath River is in a constant state of healing itself. But instead of showing tourists how sick the river is, the Yurok hope one day they can show what happens when the river is cared for. From the Klamath River in Yurok country, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the backwards. I'm really happy on this Friday because John Bartell is gracing us with his presence on this Friday. John, so good to have you on To The Point. Um, as always, everybody loves your story, so I'm so happy that you're here. But I got to ask you, after the dams are removed, how long until those fish start coming in? Yeah, well, uh, the uh, Klamath tribe, or sorry, the uh, Yurok tribe, they are actually going to, they, they're saying as soon as those dams are removed um, and that debris is cleared, they're going to be able to, those fish are going to be able to get up, right up to the top there. And when the dams are removed, what about water storage and then also electricity? Is that going to be a problem? Uh, yeah, so uh, the uh, electricity is a big thing that's uh, going to be impacted there. Uh, the, the dams are, are uh, run by uh, Power Corp, and Power Corp is a company, and they say that there's about 70,000 households. That's the electricity that's uh, created by these dams. So when it's removed, those uh, dams, uh, that, that power will be, have to be made up somewhere else in the grid there. Uh, just you got to remember the big thing here is these dams are old. One of them is 100 years old, so it's just more cost effective to get rid of it uh, instead of rebuild them here. All right, John, always great to see your face in person and not out on the back roads right now, so we appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Earlier tonight, we talked about an update to 23andMe's DNA test results that's helping some users get a clearer picture of their identity. And we're hearing from you about your experiences with DNA testing. Linda says that she did Ancestry and 23andMe tests that verified her birth mom and helped her find her birth dad. I mean, I, I don't think it gets any more perfect than that. Linda, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And then we have Barbara. She says that she was surprised to find there was zero Native American despite family lore. And also there is quite a bit of Scottish and Irish, which was previously unknown. Her mom always said that they were Heinz 57. All right, guys, thank you so much for writing in. We appreciate it. And we appreciate you spending your Friday night with us. We want to hear what's going on in your world. And there are a million ways to reach us. We have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, email. Make sure that you contact us. We hope you have a great Friday. We'll see you later. Just got